done one good thing today. Uh, my name is Geshi Kururi Sabina, and I am the national coordinator for the Civic Tech Innovation Network. Um, if you intended to attend the masterclass on uh, amplifying voice, which is on how we can uh, learn from colleagues from Citizen Lab about how we can grow and amplify the use of civic tech platforms uh, and some of the lessons uh, during the COVID pandemic, you're in the right place. Uh, if you're in the, wrong, in the wrong place, stay anyway, you might learn something. Uh, and uh, all I'm here to do is to welcome you. This is the second masterclass we're offering this month during uh, the Urban Festival. Uh, and it's an opportunity to engage with experts who are doing interesting work, in this case internationally, which we're quite privileged to have, uh, and to see how that might apply to the work that you're trying to do um, uh, in your spaces. So today we have with us uh, Alex, who's from Citizen Lab. She's sitting in Brussels, which she says is a bit grayer than she'd like. Uh, but um, she uh, heads up their partnerships work, which is quite international, and that is growing the mission and impact of a variety of partners in different countries and organizations. She's currently working, supporting partners in a whole range of countries, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Denmark, Germany, Kenya, Poland, Romania, uh, and even South Africa. So with these partners, what Alex is doing is building up a network of citizen participation experts who can develop the impactful use of Citizen Lab uh, in their country market. And I think if we're lucky today, she will show us a little bit of the actual platform uh, and some of the resources we have. Uh, and hopefully there'll be something uh, useful and interesting there for everybody. Uh, so without further ado, uh, we are going to open up the session with, well, in the tradition, in the new tradition of Urban Festival, which is the poem of the week. So Melissa, if you could just take us there. Just give me a second. The unknown says, our confidence is naive, compromise, stick to the tried and tested. Your passion is aggressive, knowing that we are coming for everything, marching forwards in numbers, in ones and zeros. The past has no leverage on us. The present expected us to stand still, but time ticked out of presence, with the future inscribing us into history's foundation, calling us by our names, including the clicks in our names and clicking of our fingers. Once not born with silver spoons in their mouths, and now makers of the spoon and benders thereof, came to this earth with answers clenched in fist, unclenching fist to be the answer. Ours is not a race to come first or be first, but to influence and impact us, energy injectors, conductors of creativity, dancers with the rain, proverbs for our posterity, signaling the speed of ideas, implanting innovation, setting standards in tradition. We are outliers, the avant-garde, belonging to secrets whispered in spaces unseen for fear of our splendor. We are resolutely spewing out stagnation as we are praising for the moon, perplexing conformity. We're not taking up space only to be muted at the table, not just conduits between what should be and is, not just bodies trading into uncharted public realms, but we are tomorrow's tools, the manifestation of ideals and scripted, leaning on the reassurance of the rising of the sun the next day. Let he without foresight cast the first doubt, whilst we, visionaries, converge at Urban Festival 2020. Welcome. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, and I think with that, we'll hand over to Alex. Alex, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Um, I will just share my screen with you. Can everybody see that? Yes. Yep, looks yeah. good. Awesome. Okay. Um, 
Thank you. Thank you all for, for joining and thank you for the, for the kind introduction. Um, so what I've put together today will hopefully be um, a bit of insight into Citizen Lab, um, who we are and what we do. But I also want to um, provide some insight and some learnings that we have uh, and potentially uh, and hopefully impart some practical knowledge of things that we've learned as well around liberation and participation and um, also within the context of, of COVID-19. Um, so just uh, yeah, so just to introduce myself, already been briefly introduced. Um, if you would like to get in touch after this, please do feel free to email me, connect with me on Twitter as well, um, and you can also have a look at Citizen Labs um, Twitter too. Um, I just want to make people aware that I will be using Slido during this session, so. If you go to sli.do um, and uh, put in the event code, you'll be able to ask some questions that I'll put up throughout the, the session as well. Um, so those will come in at different junctures and I'll put reminders in for people to ask those questions. And the idea is to review them at the end of each section as well to hopefully get a bit of interactivity and discussion going on. So, uh, as I say, I'm going to take you through a little bit about Citizen Lab. Um, then I wanted to focus on talking about deliberation and participation, how we can then look at combining deliberation and participation, how they complement each other, um, how, uh, how we can approach designing inclusivity into our uh, deliberation and participation approaches. And then I also want to look at COVID-19 and I think some of the best ways of, of learning is through case studies and understanding um, what's been done um, globally to try and combat this, this very difficult period and how governments have continued to engage um, and allow their citizens to participate. And then um, I'd also like to take you through our platform as well. So um, these, these statistics from the OECD really emphasize and back up our mission. Um, so for us, that it's, it's super important to focus on um, how citizens feel about how they're engaging with their governments, how much trust is there, do they feel like they're being heard? Um, so these are some really important statistics for us to be able to fuel um, the kind of actions and activities that we do. So, when it comes to Citizen Lab, um, we've looked at traditional models and methods of citizen engagement in government. Um, and we found that efficiency hasn't been great. Um, and this has led to public participation being low as well. So things like town halls being quite resource intensive um, and not reaching a full, the full, fullest audience that you could possibly reach. Um, having paper surveys um, or things done uh, non in an offline way um, which which can create a lack of transparency things get lost and so on um, and also when we're looking at social media um, how much of that data can we actually rely on and draw on um, how much is fueled by uh, misinformation or disinformation or how much is really fueled by um, uh, real informed um, facts um, and, and, and statistics and so on so that's where we come in. We, we've created um, a democracy, an e-democracy platform um, to, to develop a space where citizens and governments can come together to engage with one another, for governments to engage citizens, for citizens to participate. And also we've created a space for deliberation as well. And ultimately the idea is to ensure that citizens can feel that their opinions are being heard, can fully engage with the, with the processes that the, um, the government are undertaking, um, and that decisions made, policy decisions made, will be truly informed by data based on real system opinion. So this is where we stand in terms of public participation, and this is how we view um, where we are tomorrow, so to speak. Um, so the, the idea that engaging and deliberating with more citizens and people allows us to have that opportunity to co-create, to co-decide, um, and to ultimately champion citizens' voices and views, which goes on to implement citizen-backed um, uh, decisions and ideas. And this is where we see ourselves in the policy cycle. So um, pre-agenda setting, uh, sorry, post-agenda setting um, in the deliberation phase where we are uh, throwing the problems out there, looking to understand what the problems are, what the potential, <clears throat> potential ideas and solutions are, and then ultimately going on to um, assist governments with deciding and implementing um, the ideas that come through. When it comes to 
Um, looking at this particular uh, engagement ladder, we call it, we have different methods that fall under different, th these different headings. Um, and as we see, uh, we, we move towards co-decision making, co-production, we can see the degree of influence that systems have increases. So when it comes to online workshops, which is one of our tools, it's an opportunity for systems to deliberate system proposals. Those are bottom up. Um, initiatives. So there's a, there's a real opportunity to have a space for co-decision there and increase the influence that systems have in decision making. This is just a quick overview of the of the toolbox of methods that we have on the platform and that have been used traditionally in other settings as well. Um, I'll go through these in more detail and just um, kind of uh, lay out where the whether the positives and the drawbacks are of using each method and when you might use those methods as well. So um, just in a nutshell, this is, this is what we do for governments and how it works for governments when it comes to the system lab platform. So it gives governments the opportunity to engage with systems, um, manage feedback and data that gets drawn in onto the platform from systems ideas and opinions and feedback. And therefore, like I said previously, to make policy, uh, good policy and evidence-based decisions. This is just to give you a sense of um, the impact that we've had today. So uh, hundreds of governments that we've worked with, um, lots of lots of different consultation products and a massive engagement of systems as well. So um, what I am gonna do now is just activate the Slido. So if I could get everyone to um, go to Slido, so sli.do and enter the event code. Um, your first question will be there. So what do you want to get out of this session? Um, I think it's really important that I have an opportunity to also um, understand whether this has been pitched correctly, whether this covers what, what people, what people were, were thinking and hoped for. Um, but also I think there's an opportunity to, to understand where, uh, where we could fill the gaps next time. Um, so yeah, if, if people could put those, those thoughts down, that would be really, really useful. So the aim of this session um, is to provide insight learnings and I said, and, and as I mentioned, practical knowledge on the approaches to online uh, deliberation and participation. Um, with System Lab, we have a number of, of examples um, and experience to share, um, but there are also some really fantastic examples that we've seen uh, from across the world recently and, and in the past. So I'm going to look at these, um, but I also want to look at um, the offerings that deliberation and particip participation have um, and how we can make sure that these approaches are inclusive as well. Um, so, you know, th this, this might already be, be clear for some people, um, but if, if it's not, then um, it'd be, it's great to reinforce knowledge or to, or to learn something new. So I hope everyone gets something out of today. So when it comes to looking at um, deliberation, it's, it's a focus on discussion and debates across systems um, and, and a number of other stakeholders. So it should really directly inform decisions and political decision making that, that happens. Um, it's, 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 the, it's the discussion and the decision making process that, that precedes the policy making. So some examples of deliberation are things like citizen assemblies or town halls that take place. We've seen a number of successful uh, citizen assemblies that have taken place in real life. So, for example, um, citizen assemblies that have taken place in Ireland in uh, not, not that long ago around same sex marriage and around abortion as well, which have um, the, the, the lawmaking around that has really, really benefited from the citizen assemblies that they've brought together. Um, and I think what's really important to know is that uh, deliberation can directly affect decision making, particularly when it becomes an institutionalized process. So effectively, the result at the end of the system deliberation process must be respected and, uh, and brought to um, a final decision making point as well. So this is just a nice quote. Um, so deliberative democracy strengthens systems voices in government governance by including people of all races, classes, ages and geographies and deliberations that directly affect public decisions. I mean, there, there is there are far more kind of protected characteristics that you can bring into that. Um, but the idea is that everyone should have the opportunity and be included in uh, deciding what goes on in our in our functioning democracies. 
So I, I want to compare um, deliberation with participation. So um, participation centers on empowering citizens to take action. And we've seen this um, historically through uh, citizens exercising their right to protest through history to present day. Um, and we also know that includes things like voting um, through democratic institutions, responding to polls and surveys and so on. So it's an action that citizens can take to exercise democratic rights or activities rather than it being a, a, a gathering of people who have been specifically brought together and specifically informed um, to deliberate on a particular topic for a decision to be made. So I also just want to look at some of the, um, the, the, the similarities and I guess the differences. So with deliberative democracy, we always have a much smaller number um, of, of people participating. Um, and it requires them to be informed, to have the facts at their fingertips, to be able to properly consider and think through the different perspectives and the different topics and the different outcomes of the decision that they could make. Um, and it obviously gets to a point where, where there's an opportunity to debate and, uh, and, and kind of figure out what the best options are as well. Um, so when it comes to participatory democracy, um, this can be done over a, a much larger number of people. I mean, we can look at voting, um, voting in the next kind of presidential election in the US as being a massive uh, participatory democracy activity. Um, so this allows um, people to, uh, a, a whole cast of people to come together um, to, to participate and make their voice heard. Um, so yeah, so those are, those are some of the, the, the differences and just a bit of more of a deep dive into deliberative democracy and uh, participatory democracy. So I just wanted to summarize in a nutshell, um, so deliberation, bringing people together um, with, to, to have a constructive discussion and ultimately um, uh, generate an answer. Um, and participation can be uh, anything from um, a social like or, 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 something, or sharing something um, to the allocation of a participatory budget um, or a protest. So, with, uh, with participation, generally, it does require a lot less effort um, and organization than, than deliberation, um, but it does not always guarantee that further engagement or involvement from citizens. So it, it might just stop at that one survey or that one poll um, and the act of participation um, could lead citizens or, or that particular participation method could lead citizens feeling and wondering how much their involvement has act actually affected the decision. I know I certainly felt that when I, I voted in, in the Brexit referendum um, and really kind of understanding how much my vote had affected change or not. Um, and not really knowing what was, what was happening and still not knowing what's happening after that point and after that vote was cast. Um, and then we look at the drawbacks of, of deliberation as well. So I think one of the main barriers to deliberation is how complex the process can be. Um, and this really makes it difficult to, to scale and reproduce online, which is something that we're, we're turning to with, with COVID being um, a massive sticking point for, for offline deliberation and collaboration. It really requires that level of effort to organize and get right. Um, However, I think it's really important to recognize that uh, opportunities to have deliberation should be done and they can be done. Um, and it offers a really, really essential platform for citizens to engage and discuss and decide on the most important issues of the, the day. And I think we're seeing um, a continued move towards deliberation or increased activities around deliberation for citizens to take part in. So I just wanted to um, now move on to looking at uh, how, we, how we look at combining deliberation and um, participation as well. Um, so if, if, if you're able to head back onto Slido, um, that's sli.do. Um, if you enter the event code for those who have joined us since we last spoke about it, um, and it'd be great if you could share your experiences of system participation and deliberation. Um, whether that's in your particular country context or maybe um, ideas that you've heard from elsewhere, what's worked well and what didn't work so well. Um, and please feel free to ask questions as well. I'll be able to refer back to these um, towards the end of this section and then perhaps we can have an opportunity to discuss and share those points. So 
So just looking at um, the, the OECD's report on uh, catching the deliberative wave, the, the evidence really suggested that um, participation uh, when it comes to public decision making really strengthens um, what democracy means to people. It really builds that trust that citizens have in their governments. Um, and ultimately, as, as I've mentioned before, it really contributes to that data informed, system informed decision making when it comes to policies, when it comes to legislation, when it comes to day to day decisions um, for citizens lives that affect them. Um, they, they did also mention in this report as well that, that there is continuing to be a focus on deliberation or, or starting to have more of a focus on deliberation. And this is really essential to having a, a broader democratic approach for institutions um, because it enables a further level of participation um, and it, it champions, which I think is really nice, championing that, that collective intelligence uh, with this idea that there is strength in diversity, there is strength in, 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 that, in that collective thought process and idea generation. So, um, I just wanted to give some context to, to the theory and how Citizen Lab um, approaches participation and deliberation. So we, we've got, uh, for us, that there are, there are ways to combine the two things. So you can invite people to submit ideas and proposals um, for, for consideration. Um, but we can also build on these ideas as well. So these ideas can be built on from, from a forum environment to an environment that's more deliberative. Um, and we actually have a tool which is an online workshop tool to facilitate this effort as well. Um, so it's, it's, it's certainly possible um, and necessary to think about the way we look at digital tools and to allow for more deliberation. But we really also recognize that there is a need to continue to have those offline methods as well. Um, and I'll talk about fur further, further into the presentation where there are opportunities to have that crossover when it comes to offline and online deliberation and how there's potential for those two methods to work together. I wanted to um, take us through some of the participation methods, um, consultation methods. These are some of the methods that we use at Citizen Lab um, on our own platform. Um, but these are also methods that have been used um, generally throughout history um, that, that are used in an offline way as well. Um, so I just want to talk through some of the, um, the ideas around these. So with surveys, we obviously see a real enablement of systems to engage um, on specific topics. Um, and governments can, can use these to engage in a really comprehensive way. And it's a lot more comprehensive than voting because um, you know, you can allow people to, for example, rank proposals, um, answer questions in a multiple choice way. Um, there can also be questions related to demographics and so on. Um, and when this is combined with, with voting, a questionnaire can be, can be really, really useful in understanding how citizens prioritise um, different things based on their location, their age, their income, um, their gender and so on. Um, and they can also provide governments with a much more precise and individual uh, results um, precision compared to other engagement methods. I, I, one, of the, one of the drawbacks to surveys is they're not, they're not super collaborative um, and both, in, both for, for the experience of the system as well for the, for the actual co-creation policy. Um, it is more of a controlled way of, of hearing citizens' voices, but it's not necessarily an opportunity to collaborate. Um, but it does give governments a sense of, of what citizens' stances are on certain issues. With polling, um, this method is, is really useful if governments have specific questions um, in mind to ask their communities. And it's a really quick and easy way to gauge systems ideas on a particular topic. So involving your community with, with, a, with a clear cut approach, um, close ended questions, governments can, can gain a straightforward insight into citizens opinions and also get a temperature check of, or on a particular topic or particular subject and how citizens are feeling about that, whether they feel informed, ill-informed, happy, um, or, or negative about a particular uh, topic or situation. So when it comes to option analysis, so for example, if we have a local government who wants to reconstruct a local park um, and they've developed five different proposals, 
Um, all of them can be financed, all of them fit the main criteria, but it's the question of which one is best, which one do we choose? So the options analysis gives us a really nice opportunity to put this out to the public. Um, this can also be called scenario testing and it provides a really excellent opportunity to involve the community um, in the decision making and to ask citizens which proposal they prefer. And um, alongside this, this has also had the opportunity to engage in an online discussion um, and ultimately um, uh, cast their vote um, to, to, to form their final opinion um, and ultimately, hopefully, the decision making as well. So participatory budgets are um, an exceptionally powerful tool. Um, we have built an element of gamification into the tool um, to demonstrate the, the, the kind of responsibility and the weighing up of budgets that needs to take place, whether that's by national governments, local governments or, or otherwise. Um, and participatory budgeting directly involves citizens in the process of allocating uh, government budgets. So citizens will choose the projects that they think the city should, should invest in and they use the money from a specifically allocated one, uh, allocated fund in, in a simulated way. And some cities do ask citizens to divide the budget between several scenarios um, or others might start with an ideation process that then gets broken down, analysed and puts into a budgeting phase. So, for example, there might be a collection of different citizen initiatives um, from bottom up proposals, which then get voted on. And these then get moved to our participatory budgeting process to divide um, a budget across these different activities and ideas. So um, really nice way of using, uh, of, of using this with other methods as well and combining it with things like ideation processes, system proposals and so on. So when we look at ideation, um, again, this is a really nice opportunity to tap into the collective intelligence and have that um, strength and diversity of opinion. Um, and this method allows for the community to contribute to policy formulation or development through participation. And idea collection is, is often a more complicated process than a simple vote and it requires um, quite significant involvement and thought and commitment from citizens. And there's also a level of parameters that um, governments need to put in, in place when, when asking for idea collection as well to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to fill in the right boxes, that there's a standard form um, so that all the ideas are able to stand up against one another. Um, so because this process can be a bit more complicated, it does result in perhaps lower participation rates. Um, and I, th I think especially if there's a lack of a lack of trust or lack of general cooperation with uh, with the government and the citizens it might lead to a lower um, contribution to these ideas citizens thinking well what's the point in contributing if my ideas are, are never going to get heard or listened to anyway um, but what's nice about ideation is that it can also really lead to qualitative contributions and um, sharing brand new solutions i think this is really where ideas demonstrating the art of the possible could really emerge, you know, thinking of things that government has never thought about or that certain community groups might not have thought about. Um, and this is an opportunity for citizens experiences to really shine. So we've seen that citizen led um, change is, is absolutely on the rise. Um, and a clear example of this is through the popularity of citizen proposals um, or citizen initiatives. Um, which is a continuous form of bottom-up participation. Um, and uh, it doesn't fit within the regular policy cycle. So for example, on the Citizen Lab uh, platform, we give the opportunity for all citizens to contribute throughout, the, um, throughout whatever project or consultation is going on otherwise. Um, and by collecting these kinds of ideas um, and the votes and the comments associated with them, um, or contributing those, the citizens get the get get given the agency to set the political agenda at any time on any topic. Um, and what's great is that other citizens can vote on these proposals, and there's a threshold that can be set so that if votes reach um, a certain number, they will be considered by the government. Okay. Um, 
so as I mentioned, we're seeing a greater transition um, from uh, participatory democracy more towards deliberative democracy um, to, to inform decision making. Um, and I've just written down some questions to, of the kind of things that governments should be thinking about. So what do you actually want to achieve with deliberation? How are you wanting, how and why are you wanting to engage with the community? What kind of methods will be used? And how are you going to make sure that the process is inclusive and accessible, is, and accessible which is obviously a key um, if we want to get a true representation of um, citizens that live in a country um, to inform those decisions. So this is something that we use at Citizen Lab. Um, it can be used for participation. It can also be used for, for, for deliberation as well. Um, so this is actually something that we've, we've modeled off the business model canvas. So um, it's really important that when we're working with local governments, we elicit the right kinds of answers and, and the really guiding answers that will help governments um, produce the projects, produce the consultations on the platform and use the platform as effectively as possible. So there are some key questions in here. This is by no means um, limited to just these questions. There are, there are a, a plethora of questions that can be asked, but this gives us a really nice start and a really nice focus for governments that we work with um, to contribute to, uh, to, their, to their projects and their consultations and, and, and the, the lifespan of their platform and engagement with their citizens. So when it comes to approaching offline and online deliberation, I just wanted to give um, a couple of examples and a couple of um, potential opportunities. So um, do we have opportunities to com combine um, online and offline methods? Can they be simultaneous? So live streaming official events, this is something that happens so much with, with parliamentary um, question time or parliamentary presentations. Um, why, why would there not be an opportunity to do this when it comes to making, uh, continuing to make significant decisions um, and having citizens interact with those decisions that are being made? So um, can we make space for citizens to interact, um, to create that feeling of community and openness and contribution? And um, in, in Iceland, there's a really nice case study. This is not something that happened super recently, but I think it's a really important example. They... Um, in order to draw, draw up their constitution, they used uh, crowdsourcing and live streaming. Um, they, they posted draft clauses and interviews with, with members on, on, on its website, preceding this, uh, this live streaming and the social media page. Um, and then they opened its meetings to citizens and streamed them live on their, on their website. So citizens could see the constitution being written in front of them. They could see whether their, um, their views and their ideas were being informed um, into, the, into the constitution, um, even, even if, if they hadn't attended the event. So they had the opportunity to collaborate and be part of that process. As I mentioned, Citizen Lab, um, this is something that we've been working on and that we're really proud of. It came out of um, the, the COVID crisis and the need to have an online space and opportunity for governments to continue to function and engage with their citizens. So um, we've had to really rethink the way that, that we can come together. Um, and it's really ensured democratic continuity um, where many offline touch points would have would have maintained that, that those voices and that continuity. Um, so it's kind of found a new place um, online. Um, and a really good manifestation of, of this surge of, of online workshops is allowing citizens to organize live video meetings, facilitate group discussions discussions, whether that's with a focus group of citizens or a larger group, gather that input, allow for votes um, and ultimately reach, reach a consensus. Uh, so we, we launched the platform feature, um, I believe, uh, in spring, uh, late spring. Um, and we've, we've tested out with some of our, our city partners and some organizations that we've worked with and it's worked really well. Um, there's also the opportunity, as you can see here, to capture the inputs that citizens make and to download that, that as well um, and for, for further analysis and reporting following the workshop. When it comes to um, connected online and offline events, um, you know, other opportunities to discuss things online and present them offline or vice versa. 
um, that th these methods can really reinforce each other, particularly when they're tackling the same topic. So um, if, if citizens can, uh, can utilize the online pl platform, um, it will reach a, a greater number of people. As we know, the, the internet is vast and the number of people who are on it is vast as well. Um, but we also should be considering the offline participation methods and making sure um, and, and, and seeing where they can fit together and whether they, they can complement each other as well. Okay, so just looking at um, digital deliberation more specifically, um, I wanted to share some elements that the OECD considered uh, when facilitating um, digital deliberation. So um, do we want to do we want to focus on synchronous or asynchronous um, timing when it comes to digital deliberation? And many governments have been experimenting with with video workshops um, with, for example, we experiment and, and have been using an open source platform called Jitsi. Um, it's got a real opportunity. It presents a real opportunity to mirror the, the, the way town halls work. Um, and clearly there's lots of differences um, with, with having uh, online deliberation, you know, uh, systems. It, it can be very difficult to maintain concentration. Uh, maybe some of you are struggling with that at the moment with me going through this. Um, but it's, 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 it's not the same as, as having face to face. And there are, there are def definitely different uh, engagement differences with engaging with a screen to engaging in real li life. So it's really important to make it necessary to complement the, the video discussion with, with interactive methods, whether that's voting, whether that's breakout rooms, and hopefully you're finding it useful to be able to contribute on the Slido. Um, and that will give us an opportunity to discuss um, at the end of this section as well. Um, or, you know, should, should governments be relying on asynchronous communications? So things like online forums and allowing people to contribute their ideas beforehand um, to then be discussed at a, at a later date. I think what's also really important to understand and to recognize is um, how much access people have to a stable internet connection or an internet connection at all. Can we provide a space for people to contribute to, to their ideas um, and their insights and their experiences offline to then be discussed online so their voices are being heard? Another aspect to really consider is privacy. Um, should, our, should participants be able to join any debates or discussion forums anonymously? Um, sh we should really be considering if this will allow citizens to speak freely or create less trust within the discussion if they do join anonymously. Um, so in a video discussion, um, facilitating anonymity can be difficult to manage, but it's really, really important to think about what citizens are comfortable with, um, particularly environments where um, they may not want to show their face, they may not want to share their name, etc. But I think with, with written deliberation, um, being anonymous and allowing for anonymity is much easier um, and can certainly be considered. When we look at um, discussion um do we do we want to um consider the when we're looking at systems posting messages on forums um or in their in their own time on platforms these can be a really good time to to to, to organize those thoughts um when we when it's preceding um any kind of video or interactive live discussion you have the opportunity to organize those thoughts and those ideas Whereas with video chats, it can be really ch challenging to navigate the discussion. There's, um, there's a lot less overview in the debate compared to when um, ideas can be organized by topics. Um, and so there's just a couple of examples down here of um, some tools that can help organize um, written deliberation participation, uh, whether that's in, in real time or, or otherwise. And the fourth point is around moderation. So how will you moderate the discussion? Um, should it be someone from your team who's moderating it? Um, will, will, you, will you kind of be gathering data um, from, from the event to discuss and create insights? Or will you utilize something like uh, natural language processing to um, take on some sentiment analysis and cluster some ideas in, in a word cloud, for example? Um, and gather those opinions at a bit of a larger scale. Um, those things can obviously work hand in hand as well. 
Okay, so um, I want to take the opportunity now to take a look at some of the uh, Slido questions. I will actually uh, share my screen for the Slido questions so everyone can see what's been posted. Let me just do this quickly if I can. Okay. So we've got some nice uh, experiences being shared here. Um, hold on, Eve Ramadan. That's great. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really interesting point about the um, the participation being done as as a as a kind of performance act and to demonstrate uh, transparency and to kind of build a build a false level of of, of trust, I suppose. Um, and I think that's where there, there may be an opportunity to, to build that, that deliberation into place. But I think what's also important is if you are using, if governments are using participation methods, um, is there a real demonstration of that particular, uh, those, those particular ideas and thoughts being gathered? Are they being, are they being put into decision making? Um, so I think something that we, we provide on the Citizen Lab platform is an opportunity for um, the officials to reply, to engage directly with what's being said, to engage directly with ideas that are being, uh, that are being put on the platform. Um, but I, I really like the, the, the mention of, of things being co-produced. That's something that we absolutely support, that co-decision making. And that's where we see the merging of the participative um, and the deliberative um, methods coming together. So is there an opportunity to discuss things online uh, that, that have been put online or, or talked about offline um, to come together to discuss those ideas? So I think marrying those two options together is, is, is really useful. Um, is, is there anyone else as well who wanted, so thank you for your contributions, is there anyone else who wanted to contribute any questions? Um, I know there's a, there's a few people that have joined since then, I'll give people an opportunity to ask questions, if not I will move on to the next part. Okay, I will move on. Oh, sorry. I'm just looking at these questions here. Um, I will be very happy to sh share the, the, the content with you. Yes, that's absolutely fine. I can do that. Okay, so back to the slides. Um, the next section is uh, talking about designing inclusivity into your approach. Again, if I can get you to head back onto Slido um, and share your experiences, that would be fantastic. Um, so uh, what are the examples that you have of inclusivity in your country, in your city, um, or can you share any experiences elsewhere that have been a really nice example of inclusivity as well? So um, I'm going to go through, the, these slides are relatively, uh, it, it's pretty much all text, there will be some more pictures later on, but this is just, I think, really important to have a focus on um, the, the importance of uh, designing inclusion into the approach and, and the different stages and steps that you need to consider and the different aspects that need to be considered. It's really, really important um, to, to be aware of language. Um, ma making sure that it is neutral, making sure that it can be understood and, and comprehended by different, uh, different people in our society who may have varying levels of literacy and education. Um, I think it's also really crucial um, with that neutrality to make sure that we're not highlighting stereotypes. Um, 
you know identity shouldn't shouldn't be something that um is is uh is dictated by um by by the way people contribute there should be a fair opportunity to contribute um and all everyone's voices um should, should be heard and listened to um, but what's really also important is to understand uh, the demographic of people that are contributing we're making sure that we have a variety of people who are contributing as well i think it's really important to not make assumptions about our audience um, and don't try and kind of steer questions either. Um, really key to make sure that our written and visual communication is reflective of the communities and the people that we are um, that we are engaging with. So um, at Citizen Lab, um, it's really important for us to uh, when we, when we engage with a new partner in a new geography or we have interest from. Uh, from someone who who has a different language to English or, or one of the main European languages that we use, we really want to make sure that we can um, change the language and ensure that it works in that particular country and culture um, and also take on feedback where things aren't working in that particular environment to amend how we do things. So um, talking about communication more broadly, um, I think I think this is this is safe to say that and anyone would kind of know this communicating it as widely as possible um, and something that I, I really liked when I was doing some some research for this and specifically for that for the African context working with community influencers um, and I really like this quote that the struggle for democracy must be led and sustained by local stakeholders who have credibility and authenticity and they are foundation of a resilient democracy regional and international actors need to support these local actors with diplomatic and material support. And I think that that's really reflective of the mission that we have at Citizen Lab is to work with local governments um, and to really champion um, things on a local level because the local level is the most connected to citizens and the most connected to citizen actions and experiences. And so really key to focus on, on those local stakeholders and those who may have influence in the communities. So another point around um, privacy and data, um, obviously within, within the EU, we are covered by GDPR. Um, this, is, this is not necessarily the same um, everywhere else, whilst, whilst GDPR is used as a gold standard. Um, but I think just picking out a couple of points that should be, should be focused on and pr put front and center around protecting users, users' privacy. Um, so really making sure that uh, it clearly states what is going to be done with personal data, why it's being collected, and giving the opportunity for people to um, participate anonymously where possible. Um, do is there an opportunity to um, redact their name, change their username, have a username that is not necessarily reflective of their name? Um, at Citizen Lab, we've recently um, developed uh, a way of doing this where we redact the person's surname and it's just their first name with the first letter of their surname to allow for a level of, uh, of kind of anonymity um, and to allow people to feel more comfortable contributing. I think this is also this is a really really key point and a point that um, a lot of companies, a lot of governments, local or otherwise, fall down on is collecting far more personal data um, than is needed um, and just collecting it for the sake of it. So, really important to note that more more data does not equal um, better data or better better insights. So, I think really important to focus on the kind of information that you want to collect about citizens, about users, to inform um, the work that you do. So this is something um, at Citizen Lab that we are working on at the moment and we recognise um, areas that we, that we need to improve. So making sure that platforms that you use or um, the way you are distributing things online is compatible with different kinds of devices. Um, and so that's something that we're thinking about at the moment is how can we make um, our platform as compatible with mobile as possible? Um, how can we integrate the uh, opportunity to engage with SMS and not necessarily WhatsApp, but more kind of analog ways of, of engaging on a mobile device. Um, and also um, really important is to ensure um, where possible um, to, to have software that is, uh, is assistive for uh, visually impaired systems to, to be able to engage. 
So when it comes to offline and online, um, you know, this is obviously budget willing um, and this is, this is about digital infrastructure as well. So there are obviously broader questions that feed into these questions, um, but can computers be provided that can be accessed in a public space like a library or a community center? Um, can, we, can you create a really structured way of, of, um, of allowing people to, to use those computers to contribute their opinions? Is there an opportunity um, for those who don't have the digital literacy or skills to contribute a physical, in a physical space, in a physical way where they can leave their views, share their ideas, whether that's by mouth, whether that's writing something down, um, could they respond to a survey in that way? Um, can you, and, and something I've mentioned before, can you still hold offline engagement like town halls um, to discuss ideas that have been shared online or vice versa? And I just want to mention, and I'm sure all of you are aware of this, but this is all with the consideration that uh, COVID measures are kept in place and there's um, absolute safeguarding um, for, people's, for people's health. I think one of the things that falls off the list um, when it comes to building um, engagement opportunities and participation opportunities is how, how, how are we doing with, with engagement? How is it working? Um, are we getting the right kind of people responding? So I think this is something that's really important to be able to keep an eye on along your, your project timeline or, or whatever platform you're using. Um, who is participating? Who's responding? Is our audience diverse? Are we having that diversity in opinion? Um, and then reflecting on, on what needs to be changed. Why are we not reaching young people? Or why are we, we not a, able to engage with older people? What kind of methods do we need to change or improve? And I think something that's really important is not worrying about needing to change that direction because I think it's, it, it's much better to be on the right path and to ha have lost a little bit of time um, because you've listened to the data or lack of data and to continue with an approach and to change your approach um, rather than continuing with an approach that isn't going to give you truly representative or as close to representative results as possible. Um, so just going back to Slido and looking at um, people sharing their experiences of inclusivity um, So we've got one here. So uh, I've lived in a very metropolitan area and the use of different languages to engage local citizens and foreigners who aren't necessarily permanent citizens was truly the best way that I've seen local leaders engage with citizens. So that's a really nice example. Um, and someone here talking about their experience from a while ago of a uh, upgrade and development of a local park being successful because community engagements and civil organizations were involved from the beginning and gave input to the plan ongoing uh, and during the implementation. So that's, those are really, really nice examples there as well. Um, I'm just wondering uh, where is the chat function so I can see if there's anyone who's asked questions on here. Okay, if anyone does have any questions, please feel free to, like I say, ask in the Slido um, or ask in the group, group chat as well. Um, there'll also hopefully be opportunity at the end to um, have a, have a Q&A um, or for people to share their thoughts um, towards the end of this. So moving on to COVID-19 um, and the impact that it's had. So I think we're, we're safe to say that um, our lives have immeasurably changed. Um, we're all having to face a new kind of normal in so many different facets of our lives and democracy and in how we engage with our governments, how, how governments engage with our citizens is no different. It's, it's, it's all having to face up to change and to amend the way that we're doing things. And I think technology previously has been seen as a, as a nice to have and ever increasingly we're seeing it as something that is becoming really truly integral to the way we are operating as a society, as a government, as citizens. So um, I think what's really some of the research that I've been doing has really conveyed whether governments have seen this as an, as an opportunity to engage with citizens or whether they've seen this as um, a way of, of as I say, a, a getting out of jail free card to continue in a non-transparent and non-consultative way. Um, so 
I will focus in the case studies on the more positive aspects where there has been engagement, but I think it's also really important to recognize the governments that uh, are, are continuing to, to have a negative effects on their countries, on their citizens, and not engaging with their citizens in a way that can really contribute to um, really important decision making. Um, I think it's also, yeah, like I said, important to, to recognise that the governments who do want to listen, um, whether that's during this, this pandemic or, or otherwise. And um, regardless of how long I think it takes to get out of this pandemic, I think technology will continue to have um, the role that we're seeing it to have in our, in our lives moving forward and with the way we engage with government. So I just wanted to um, now move on to some of our case studies. So this is a, this is a case study um, from a commune in Paris and this, they actually used our platform. Um, so they've been using it for the last uh, couple of years and what they did in 2009, they hosted um, a really broad participatory budgeting project. Um, on the Citizen Lab platform, and they also, um, which is a really nice mix of the offline and, and online, they provided physical ballot boxes to ensure that those who didn't have access to computers, internet, or didn't have the digital skills to use them had the opportunity to contribute as well. What was really nice about these, uh, the, the participatory budgeting projects is that they set a really clear criteria. Um, they had a focus on different policy areas um, and a budget level for particular ideas. And citizens had the opportunity to also post ideas and the community voted on those ideas. And during this project, they had 30,000 people visiting the platform. And ultimately, there were eight winning projects that came out of this uh, consultation as well. Unfortunately, because of COVID, um, they had to uh, pivot quite significantly from the focus on these projects, which obviously they, they got a decision on, which was great, to um, how could they use the platform for, for COVID. And um, it, it's really been a hub for the community over this period, and it's allowed the commune to maintain dialogue with citizens and has really helped coordinate local volunteering efforts during the pandemic as well. Um, it's a really nice practical effect of, of uh, loads of masks being produced by, by volunteers and distributed to those in need and also food baskets being um, being created and delivered to, to vulnerable and needy families. Um, and this has all been coordinated um, via, via the platform. Um, this is an example that uh, is not necessarily related to COVID. Um, it's related to COVID in the sense that COVID pushed it online. Um, a number of the preceding sessions took place offline, um, but the Climate Assembly in the UK had to adapt to running um, this entirely online. Um, and they, they found, I think it basically should say that this is the second citizen assembly um, in the world after the climate convention um, that took place in France. Um, they had a really successful turnout. This is actually um, a screenshot of just one of the breakout rooms from the, uh, from the actual assembly. Um, and it, it, I think it went, it went very well and it was very successful. So this, um, this case study might be familiar to some of you. Um, GovChat South Africa, um, the, the largest civic engagement platform um, that's accessible online on, on any mobile, which is, which is a massive feature um, for, for South Africa and the, and the wider um, African continent. Um, and what they've done is they've enabled governments to directly speak to citizens and there's no cost to the citizen to do that. Um, and they have a number of different partnerships with um, different government associations. So they've, they've got a partnership with the um, local government association in South Africa, um, the Department of um, Governance and Affairs, um, and they also have a partnership with um, the Government Department of Communication and Information Systems. Um, they also very recently, um, during the COVID outbreak, announced, announced a partnership with um, the Social Security Agency in South Africa. And this is with the view of being able to support um, the grant application process um, when it comes to enabling social, social relief um, for, 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 for the most vulnerable and those seeking support um, during this period in South Africa. 
Um, so the partnership, um, this part, this particular partnership is to um, enable uh, many, many people um, to access uh, what I believe to be is the largest um, security program um, in Africa. And this can all be done from, from mobile devices. So I have saved um, what I believe is, is a really interesting case study uh, for last. So this is the last case study I'll be focusing on. And then I'd really like to open up um, the opportunity for questions, for discussion. Maybe people want to take a little break. And if not, if there's no questions or, or discussion, then, then we can, we can uh, obviously come to a close. Um, but this, this, is a really great, um, this is a really great case study. So Taiwan has the same population size as Australia. And since the beginning of the pandemic, it has reported 529 infections. Um, and this is very low considering it's a country that does continuous testing. Um, and it, it's definitely some of the lowest infection numbers in the world, uh, for, for, as I say, for countries who are actively testing citizens. So um, some, of their, some of their thought processes and the way that they um, connect with technology and uh, digital initiatives. Um, so I've just pulled out some of the things that they focus on. So there has been a really strong um, collective nar narrative that they've built. Um, and this has enabled a really strong sense of democracy online as well. Um, and I think what's really great to see, and I think this also uh, combines with the previous point around getting local leaders and civic society uh, to enable citizen engagement, is because government has been seen to work with civil society, this has really generated a great sense of public trust. Um, and uh, particularly when it comes to working in online spaces and digital spaces. They've been very thoughtful um, in, in the way that they've used technology. So I think the, the, the term kind of move fast and break things does not apply here. And I think it should often not apply in cases like this when you're dealing with uh, mass health problems, um, and uh, you're dealing with how citizens' health and how citizens can be engaging and uh, contributing to the fight against the, the pandemic that we're seeing at the moment. So, um, yeah, so we've seen a, a really great use of technology um, and a, a real leaning on the strong digital infrastructure that they have, which is obviously a central part of how they've been able to operate, having a really strong uh, digital infrastructure. Um, They've really made sure and made space for um, citizens to uh, participate and um, air their concerns, um, to highlight um, difficulties that um, they might be facing during this time. And I think what's really great as well, they've also fostered um, their, their digital minister, um, Audrey Tang, has been brilliant at fostering um, this culture of civic participation, which has followed a lot of the open source um, software communities. So um, just looking at how their, uh, how their responses um, were in line with, with the principles that they built, so fast, fair and fun. Um, as, I, as, I, as, as I mentioned, um, they've had really, really low um, case rates, and this is because they responded almost immediately um, to hearing about the outbreak. They were one of the first countries in the world to detect and respond to the virus. Um, and this was significantly down to crowdsourced information and collective intelligence um, through online bulletin boards. So um, there were warnings of the virus. Um, from a citizen um, that were noted on the 31st of December 2019 and um, this this forum was was also connected to government officials and a government official uh, a senior government health official saw this on the on the bulletin board of this forum um, and saw that it was significantly upvoted and was able to take action from that point. Um, FAIR, so um, this is a, a massive guiding, guiding principle um, for, uh, for, for the response in Taiwan. So uh, they've published stock levels of masks um, and uh, they've also ensured that um, pharmacies and other shops that haven't been, uh, that are opened beyond pharmacy opening times have also been able to sell masks so that if, you're, if you finish work 
after pharmacy closing times that you can access masks as well. They've also ensured rationing of masks, um, which obviously creates a huge amount of fairness, limiting access to a certain number of masks per week per person. They have also used um, fun to uh, ensure that they are combating what they call humour over rumour. Um, and this is where it comes to uh, combating and countering disinformation and misinformation that we have seen so much of um, over, this, over this COVID period. Um, and I think it's, it's really nice because it's allowed them to spread a kind of factual humour um, over this pandemic period and people have been engaging with the humour but have also um, been given trusted and fact-backed information to, to inform their decision making on a day-to-day -day level and so um, if you if you look at this meme um, on the on the slide you can see that that's actually their um, their prime minister there um, with his back to us and uh, from what I've what I've what I understand and what I've researched this particular meme focuses on the fact that as people, um, generally, we only have one, one pair of buttocks, so do, there is no need to purchase uh, more toilet paper than you need. So as you can see, using humour uh, to uh, not fan the flames and worry that citizens may have about toilet paper running out. Um, I just wanted to end on, on this slide. Um, so what's great about Taiwan is that they have opened up their tools and their models and they've made all of this available um, on an open source basis at taiwancanhelp.us. So any country, any government, um, any organization can, can pick up these tools, can learn these lessons um, and, and try and build them into their own uh, ways of operating when it comes to combating COVID-19 in their societies. And I've just posted here, this is a poem that um, Audrey Tang, uh, the digital minister in, in Taiwan, um, developed uh, for one of the conferences that she was speaking at. Um, but I just thought it's a nice way of, of viewing um, uh, often esoteric term in a, in a really uh, human way. That is, that is it from me. Um, I'm very happy to, uh, like I say, answer any questions, have a bit of a discussion. Um, so are there any particular questions that, that people have or anything that anyone wants to raise? Melissa, I don't know if, if people can, if, if they're able to unmute their microphones. Yeah, I have a, I have a, a question or I can hear me first of all. Yes, I can. Right, um, so I, I my, my, my concern about, you know, because we, I'm from like, I've seen communities, oh, let me just speak about my own experiences that I've, I've seen people quite fatigued with community participation and we've seen very low levels of um, participation during before COVID, right? When we could all meet and, you know, when people were free to, to meet up with us. Um, and you, you had very little attendance, like, like, the, like in, in, a, in, a, in a very big community, you have like 20 people come to meetings and it's the same people all the time. And I'm thinking now that, you know, like we just, now we have to meet online uh, and online platforms can, can be very distant. Yeah, I mean, can feel very distant. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in my head, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if this is a question or statement that I make really, but in my head, I'm just like, how do we move people? How do you make people who are not very keen on participating before to an online platform that may seem very distant, you know? Um, yeah, I'm not sure if anyone can answer that or, because uh, in my head this whole time throughout the presentation, I'm thinking, um, how do we do this? in communities that are not very keen on, on, on participation. Yeah, thank you. And, and when you talk about participation, is it, is it uh, not being keen because they don't think that their opinions will be, will be kind of enacted and listened to? Or is it because there, is, um, there are barriers to participation when it comes to physically being able to get to somewhere or having access to the internet? Or is it a combination of everything? I suppose, um, I mean, uh, when I look at, at my the community 
be that I'm, I'm part of, for instance. Like, so we, so before when like with bigger issues like electricity to you know to talk about, uh, housing to talk about, there was like lots of participation. So those things were delivered, and then there were like smaller issues to you know to talk about. There was no interest in in dealing with that, especially because like you you asked in the first question. It was really hard getting those those you know those big things mm. right. So there's like fatigue from uh, I I'm not sure we're gonna get these things because they're not as big. Um, so I suppose it's it's just from that that like there's no there's there's um, a lack of trust in the system, um, and so there's just like uh, you know uh, there's no need for us to be there anyway because there's nothing that's gonna be done. So you know getting people on an online platform that may that that's distant. And you know, like I, it's a waste of my, of, of my, of my bandwidth. <laughs> really. Sure. Yeah, and I think that's a that's a really fair point. And I think, I think at the end of the day, that all this this is all really hard. It's really hard to develop engagement. It's really hard to in certain countries get over maybe a sense of um, apathy um, it's really hard to um, how, how do you kind of encourage a government who is struggling with budgets to develop a, the, the digital infrastructure that can support online engagement you know there, there I think there are so many there are so many variables that can affect online engagement um, and I think I think that's where it does take time. I think that these things can't be rushed. These things need to be tested. Um, so, you know, how do you build that trust? How do you build that engagement when a government hasn't been doing it in the past? Um, if you've got, if you've got a new government that comes in that wants to reach out to the electorate, how do you do that? These are really, really tough questions. Um, and it's going to take more than a, than an online platform to do that. Um, it's definitely a, a wider question of, uh, you know, how do our democratic institutions operate? Have we listened to our systems in the past? Um, what resources do we have at hand to be able to communicate what we're doing, share what we're doing, um, and ultimately bring systems into the fold? Um, so that's a really tough question to answer. Um, I think you know that there are limits to, to, to online online participation methods, but there are also some real opportunities to engage with, for example, younger communities who um, are often often online, who um, have been you know we've seen a lot of activity from uh, younger younger groups when it comes to recent um, political, cultural, um, socio-economic matters. Um, massive stuff around climate change. We've seen loads of loads of youth initiatives around um, Black Lives Matter. So, is there a way of being able to harness that energy um, of young people to build to build a forum of discussion and, and participation and engagement? But it, it's a really difficult ask, and it's a really difficult thing to do to uh, to build a system engagement where there isn't that that level of trust or transparency or accountability previously from governments. But thank you for the question. Um, yeah, a lot to think about. Any other questions from, from anyone else or comments? I do also have um, a couple more slides to go through and I want to show you the, the platform too, but um, please feel free if there are any questions, we can ha have questions after I show the platform as well. I, I don't mind, we have the time, but if anyone has any questions now, feel free to go ahead. Okay, I will move on to showing you uh, giving, showing you some slides that I've got um, regarding System Labs platform, and then showing you the the platform itself. Um, so I mentioned this earlier on in the presentation, um, the three pillars that support um, the way we approach system engagement, participation and deliberation. Um, so what does our platform offer? It offers the opportunity to engage um, citizens on, on local topics, um, on, 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 on being able to, to share their ideas. Um, what we what we ensure is that there's an opportunity to personalize the platform to a particular municipality or city or national government um, and this is done through the design um, and the customization in that respect um, but there's also a wealth of information that you can supply on the platforms um, sharing plans that have already been in place sharing documentations about consultation and projects um, uploading videos photos etc 
And again, um, looking at the different kinds of uh, methods of engagement with the, the survey and polling um, opportunities and methods as well, and an opportunity to co-create and co-decide when it comes to ideas, um, taking reactions from systems and also uh, en engaging systems in participatory budgeting and voting on budgets. Um, we have a very comprehensive back office when it comes to being able to look at the data and the information that is generated um, from system engagement. So being able to manage ideas, being able to manage the projects that you have, um, understanding the type of users that you have on the platform and segmenting um, the, the, the different users, the different topics that are being voted on, what, what concerns, um, what, what, what are the concerns that most people have when it comes to climate change, when it comes to sustainable development, when it comes to health and education. Um, and uh, internally, um, as an organization or a local government, you can also really easily manage um, internally and have different project managers, different administrators on the platform as well. In terms of um, reporting um, after after analysis, um, we have an opportunity to build insights. Um, there is a reporting function as well. You also can communicate really widely with the users. Um, there's an email function built in and a number of notifications that you can trigger. If you start the consultation process, for example, you can trigger people and, and remind them to, to come onto the platform and, uh, and let their voice be heard. Um, and there's also a really comprehensive data management as well on the platform. Okay, I am going to move across to the demonstration now. Okay, so I have, um, th th we, we've recently been talking to um, a governmental office um, in the Republic of South Africa. So I'm using this, uh, this platform to, to demonstrate that. So when you do open the, the platform, this is the, the page that you see, you can see the different projects um, that are being used by the, the city or the government um, to, to engage citizens. So this is a demonstration of all the different methods that we use, all the different consultation methods that we use on the platform. Um, you can also see them in the drop down menu over here. So ideation, polling, mapping, surveying and participatory budgeting. We also have the, the bottom up approach. So the opportunity um, for citizens to, uh, to post their proposals and their ideas, regardless of where the government might be in the policy development cycle. Um, there is an opportunity here to, to post ideas that they may have. So, um, for example, um, building a new playground, um, you can put as much information as you want in there. The local government has an opportunity to give their updates about the particular ideas. So, for example, if the threshold reaches 300, then they may post an official update suggesting um, that this is something that they're going to consider in their next policy making round. Um, and what's great is that you can also associate it with um, different topic tags as well, which comes in handy for developing insights um, around system engagement and, and topics that systems are engaging on. Just going back to um, the ideation method. So this particular example is around um, uh, building a strategic plan. Um, and what we can see here is uh, the different ideas the systems have posted in relation to the strategic plan. Um, we've also, you, you can also, as the, as the administrators of the platform, post your own ideas for uh, systems to, to, to post on. You can post only your ideas as well to have some structure. Um, but these are the way um, uh, this, this works in terms of uh, ideas being posted. So if we have a look here, we can see that there's an opportunity to upvote or downvote. Um, you can add topic tags as well. Um, and again, the descriptions and official updates can be posted too. I also mentioned um, surveys. So um, if we take a look at surveys, um, and just to note, all of our consultation methods have a timeline that can be built in, and you can go between uh, different sections of the timeline per method. And this is what's really nice is that this can show how different methods have informed other methods. So for example, you may have used um, a poll to then inform a survey and so on. Um, 
And the, so the survey function is great. You can embed um, multimedia. You can have different types of open and closed questions um, to elicit different kinds of responses and to provide structure as well. And the last method I'll talk you through is our participatory budgeting. So um, as I mentioned during the presentation, um, we have developed this. And what's great is that you can um, divide it between different neighborhoods, different districts, different councils or wards representing different groups of people. And you can allocate only those people who live in that particular district to allocate the budget that's associated with their district. So um, this is where I mentioned we've introduced an element of gamification. Um, so it simulates the responsibility um, and the decision making that has to go on when balancing the budgets. Um, and you can click into the different ideas and get an understanding of what exactly this, this particular um, idea is about, how it will be spent and how it might benefit the community as well. And so there's an opportunity for systems to add to their particular basket and balance the budget and submit their expenses to be recorded by the system. And just very quickly, I will go back to showing you our online um, workshop tool as well. Um, so this is where we are able to um, develop a timeline for an online workshop um, and you're able to put people in breakout rooms. Um, you are able to gather uh, the information and the uh, ideas that are posted, the feedback that's posted, and you can, you can download that into a CSV file to use for, to develop insights and reports later on. So just going back to the platform, I will also very briefly show you our back office. Um, where there's an opportunity to look at the uh, the users that are on there, who's on there, um, what kind of what number of ideas are being generated, what are the most important topics to systems. You can look at this via ideas, via comments, via votes, um, and you can also manage all your projects from the back office as well. Um, so I'll I'll I'll, I'll leave it at that for now if any of you would like a more in-depth look at the platform i'd be very happy to to take you through it um we also have uh, business development managers in in different geographies as well if you know anyone who could make use of this platform so please do get in touch if you think this is something that could be useful to you or if you just want to have further discussion okay um that's it from me. So if there are any questions, please feel free to throw them out there um, or feel free to make a comment or if there's any feedback, it'd be great to hear from you. Um, if not, I will hand over to Melissa. Okay, I'm guessing we don't have any more questions. Um, Okay, so thank you for joining us, Alex, and for that wonderful masterclass. I hope everyone enjoyed it. And to just say this is our next masterclass for everyone. So be sure to join us or share um, whichever suits you. Um, yeah, and that's it. Thank you guys for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.